Hello and let's talk about the NEET and JE exams. These exams for obtaining entrance to the medical and engineering courses will be held as per schedule according to the National Testing Agency. The NEET for medical courses will be held on September 13th, while the JE main will be held from September 1 to 6. This is despite student organizations and many opposition parties pointing out that this is a bad idea at a time when the country has no handle on the pandemic. In fact, the Students' Federation of India held an online campaign today called Health Before Exams to highlight this issue. Parents' associations have also been making demands for postponing the exams and in a meeting of opposition parties, West Bengal Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee suggested that all opposition chief ministers approach the Supreme Court jointly on this matter. Last week, the Supreme Court had dismissed a petition to postpone the exams. We talked to Dipshita Dhar of the Students' Federation of India on some of these issues. Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are joined by Dipshita Dhar, who is the All India Joint Secretary of the Students' Federation of India and we will be talking to her about how the government has refused to uh, postpone the national level entrance exams of JE and NEET, which are, which are a crucial part of students' careers. So Dipsta, can you tell us what kind of impact will this have on students' lives right now? What, you know, how would this, uh, what would students go through if they have to give to the exam right now? And also what is the SFI stance on this, on this mm-hmm. issue? Uh, the thing is that I think a lot of people are asking us this question that why you are demanding uh, for postponement of the exam. I think it should first understand that why uh, a group of uh, students, like a large number of students, I would say, uh, who are preparing for their need, who are preparing for their JE for such a long time, along with that, the third year students who were all somehow uh, taking the preparation for their final year examination. Uh, there must be a reason why all of a sudden all these students are coming together and saying that, Uh, They're not going to give examination or they want the government to postpone the examination. Why so? I think the reason being uh, that the way our government has failed uh, in managing this pandemic situation, in managing this COVID situation, uh, that actually had uh, brought in so many students, students who earlier didn't have any political affiliation, to come up and ask this question to government. Uh, If you see right now, we are having the largest, third largest number of people who are affected with corona. If you look at the number of people who died due to COVID, we are having the uh, fourth highest number uh, in in the the whole world. And also daily, the number of people who have been uh, killed due to COVID, we are one of the topmost countries. So in a situation like that, where the government uh, essentially could not do anything to give people this confidence that during a health crisis, the government is going to take care of you. I think it's very natural that students are scared. Students are feeling that in this pandemic situation, if we are forced, uh, to go to examination center, we, we might also get affected. And this, this whole fear is not very unrealistic. We just have heard that few days back in Banaras Hindi University, where a student uh, went to uh, give his examination. He tested positive after appearing for the examination and he had to uh, admit in uh, a hospital and all the examination that was scheduled later, he was not able to uh, sit on them. So, so this, is a, this is a practical situation. People are scared because uh, they all, of course, they, they are good students. Uh, They want to pursue certain careers, but at the same time, they are scared of their lives. Uh, They do not want that for a sake of examination, uh, they compromise their health, they compromise their life. And I think in that uh, situation only, we see this many, uh, so many people. I mean, if you look at Twitter every day, uh, anything or uh, anything around the postponement of examination, need JE, all these things are trending. And the number of tweets uh, that have been tweeted, sometimes that reach even million. So this is a, this is an actual uh, situation that we are dealing with. And from Student Federation of India, we have believed in that uh, uh, the student's life needs to be you know, taken care of. You, as a government, you cannot just come and say that uh, it's a student's own responsibility, how they're going to go to examination. Uh, even the NTE also had come up and said they're going to increase the number of uh, seats, uh, centers, etc., etc. But we do believe that this is not enough uh, because you also must see that we are not only fighting a health crisis. We are also fighting a situation where India is going through a huge unemployment crisis. People are committing suicide. People are dying out of hunger because, the, because of the unplanned lockdown, the question of employability, the question of livelihood is in, uh, un, under threat. So, and, and on that, we have also seen that in different parts of our countries also fighting natural calamity. We are seeing in Assam, we have seen in West Bengal, in Rajasthan, in Mumbai. So there are multiple problems that as a family, uh, as, a, as students, they are facing. And right now, we thought that whatever the government has done, that is not enough to ask students to come and appear for examination. So from SFI, our stand is that uh, if at all the the, the government is eager to take examination, first they should ensure 
that the health of the students that their livelihood question is 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 going to be answered by the government until and unless they do it we do not see that there is a logic uh, on putting so many young people into such utmost risk our next segment is part of a series of conversations on the us china relationship especially the us tech assault on china in this segment charles zhu of the chiao collective talks about a failing us attempt to build a coalition against china especially on issues such as covid-19 he also talks about the declining credibility of the us due to its failure to handle the epidemic properly at a global level right now do you see that the us has been actually able to gather allies for this especially among its european allies or has this become more and more a losing cause that's a really good question um i think that it's 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 still kind of hard to say uh since we are very much in the middle of of the pandemic mm -hmm. now but i uh, <clears throat> you know in in sort of material terms i think that the you know very much uncontrolled uh and disastrous uh you know in both in both sort of human and economic terms spread of covid-19 that we've seen in the US right uh and the wide public awareness of this globally you know the fact that that uh uh the US is is on almost every you know country's uh uh um sort of no travel list at the moment right, right. uh is 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 testament to the fact that 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 on balance i think i think the pandemic has absolutely weakened uh the united states uh credibility certainly certainly it's it's soft power apparatus um and that the approach of at least the current administration uh has absolutely been uh you know to to paper over and and you know occlude and indeed like like falsify and exacerbate the scale of of uh the pandemic in the United States while uh uh you know trying with 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 you know ever greater desperation um to to pin the blame on China to sort of rewrite uh the narrative of the early stages of the covid-19 pandemic uh right. in order to to make china out to be at at best a negligent and at worst an actively malicious actor um and i you know my sense my sense is that it's not really taking um you know uh it's it's it, it's very hard comparing you know the just just the visible uh uh you know indicators of of the situation now with regard to covid-19 in china versus the united states uh to make the claim <clears throat> that that china as the very first country hit by it um which which had to you know go through all the stages of 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 identifying what was going on of of uh you know sequencing uh the virus of uh you know establishing its human transmissibility of essentially you know uh coming up with some kind of um some some kind of protocol exactly for for uh for controlling its spread and 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 doing so under the circumstances quite successfully um that that i think has just become harder and harder to deny right and i uh, you know this whole thing must be seen as well uh in you know as as you said the uh the the broader context of of the us painting china for various reasons right um whether because of you know the fact of its increasing global reach you know the uh you know it's very foreignness right um in 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 every sort of major respect uh to you know the traditional uh you know colonial or neocolonial centers of power um as as this kind of uh global threat right i uh, and and this is where you see as well you know the the prevalence of of conspiracy theories that that attribute you know the the origin of covid-19 for example to like a chinese lab right um that that uh uh try to you know put all this in 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 a sort of biosecurity framework that lend itself very much to uh uh you know anti-asian xenophobia right um <clears throat> to uh um targeting right of uh of you know people of asian descent particularly chinese uh both for sort of uh you know sort of spontaneous 
uh, acts of, of, of racial violence, such as we've seen in the US and across the, uh, the wider world, and sort of on a more systematic level, um, you know, dovetailing with uh, this, 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 this narrative uh, that, you know, like the presence of, uh, of, of people of Asian descent uh, is ipso facto in and of itself, uh, you know, the, 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 the inclusion of, of a, a, uh, a necessarily foreign and dangerous element within uh, one's own population, right? Kind of treating the viral metaphor uh, at, at the scale of the body politic of the entire country. Right. Um, that's, that's what we're seeing operate on multiple levels. And I think it's no accident, right, that, that you know, with the, uh, this sort of epochal challenge to U.S. credibility, uh, to, you know, at least sort of the ideological foundations of, of U.S. hegemony in the world system um, that is presented by, by uh, its, its catastrophic mishandling of, of the pandemic. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're seeing uh, the Trump administration in particular, you know, double down on uh, the targeting of, you know, particular Chinese researchers, right? And, and exactly. uh, indeed sort of, you know, uh, uh, academics of, of of Chinese descent, even even U.S. citizens, right, uh, in the United States itself. I think there there's a sort of a fairly broad coalition within within you know the the, the Asian American community generally, uh, you know, including including liberals uh, against uh, against the sort of naked targeting that we've seen under the Trump administration. But I think a crucial weakness of that narrative is that. Um, it essentially takes as a given the uh, the prerogatives of the U.S. state. It relies in many ways on the argument that you know these are uh, you know whether Chinese nationals or, or 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 you know U.S. citizens of Chinese descent who who are going to the point of of applying for security clearances, right? Who want to contribute to the economic and in many cases the military uh, betterment. Of, of the United States, you know, who, who, who uh, are uh, like a positive, you know, uh, who, who are making positive contributions to, to uh, you know, US economic strength and, and, and military supremacy. And the essential weakness of that argument, you know, is, 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 is that it, it ultimately relies on the same sort of uh, uh, ideological coordinates that you know form form the crux of of the entire you know sinophobic campaign being waged at a bipartisan level you know not just by trump but uh, you know in many ways by by the democrats as well who you know uh, from 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 the left to the right end of of the ideological spectrum that they encompass have completely sort of bought in to to the narrative of of um, you know uh, of, of, of China, like stealing jobs, right? Uh, of it, um, you know, posing a threat to, to U.S. hegemony, uh, and who's, you know, presidential nominee now, uh, Joe Biden, uh, in many ways seems to be trying to outdo uh, Trump in some aspects of his Sinophobia, right? right. Uh, accusing him, for example, in a campaign ad of uh, imposing the travel ban on China uh, after the start of COVID-19 too late. Right of allowing in, you know, tens of thousands of of, right, right. of 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 potential like spreaders, you know, in a very very racialized way, and and this is why I think that there is, uh, you know, absolutely a danger that, you know, if Biden wins in November, as it seems like he will, we will see uh, a continuation of, you know, this kind of aggression on multiple fronts that that you're referring to. Um, but with a veneer, right, with with, exactly. with 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 a face that is much more palatable to uh, you know the the U.S. Uh, and its allies, right, than 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 Trump, who who was absolutely uh, willing, you know, particularly uh, for the sake of his base, to alienate uh, you know traditional sub-imperial uh, uh, allies of the United States, right, uh, Canada, the EU, and so on. And so um, we're, you know, we're in a moment now where uh, I think 
there have been many sort of uh, like self-inflicted injuries on on the U.S.'s credibility there that that can very easily be papered over just by a change in administration. Exactly. Um, and I, uh, you know, without changing any of the, the the fundamentals, which is that you know the U.S. is still the hegemonic imperial power. You know, uh, it still occupies a dominant position. Uh, thanks in particular to, to uh, you know, its outsized military budget, which is around 10 times the size of China's, right? Uh, its actual global reach, you know, where uh, it, it, you know, is, is able essentially to surround China um, uh, on sort of the Pacific side, on the southern border, and uh, in terms of its presence, of the U.S. presence in Central Asia on its western border as well, uh, with, with a string of, of, of you know, U.S. bases and a forward deployments uh, by by naval and air forces as well, you know, um, and where uh, in addition to that sort of physical, uh, uh, you know, uh, cordon in some ways around around China, it's exerting you know the same uh, uh, kind of naked aggression uh, on an economic level as well, uh, and and I think that you know the left. Globally, and in, in particular in the, here in the U.S., right? This is something that we, as the Chow Collective, repeatedly return to. Uh, you know, we need to be clear-eyed about the fact that this is not, you know, an inter-imperial rivalry between equals. You know, it is. Uh, it's 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 a country uh, that you know, sort of looking at historical experience of other socialist states, right? Like the USSR, uh, in particular. Um, you know, has adopted a long-term strategy of, of uh, or, or, you know, a clear-eyed view of, of what it takes to actually uh, get to a position where, where it and other global South countries can actually, you know, pursue, uh, you know, an independent strategy for, for their own development, right? Uh, for building their own productive forces. But we're still in very, very, you know, very much a weak position compared to the imperial hegemon, where it's in no position to mount a frontal challenge to, to, to U.S. power, and where, um, you know, the uh, uh, like the actual dynamics are still are still very much, um, you know, like unilateral uh, sort of uh, one directional aggression being levied against it by uh, a much stronger power that is seeking to maintain its position against you know manifold threats that are that are very much uh, uh, you know inherent to to uh, the global capitalist system as a whole thank you so much Charles, for talking to us thank you that's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with major news developments from the country. Until then, keep watching News Click.